So, yes, uh, my name is Tambet Matizen. I'm representing the Autonomous Driving Lab. Uh, our session was the last of the summer school, so I'm sure everybody is tired already and uh, just uh, wants to be a little bit entertained. Maybe I can do this, maybe not, we will see. <laughs> uh, but at least we try. So the plan is, as, we, as you saw already, so I will do a short uh, presentation about the Autonomous Driving Lab, uh, what the lab is about, and then we will move to the courtyard, and there will be the car, and people there will uh, uh, introduce you the car, the sensors, and uh, roughly how it works. Then uh, we cannot give demo rights to all of you, so we will do a small lottery uh, there, and maybe 10 people can experience the demo ride with an autonomous car. Uh, we will see it there. But those who, who are not lucky, uh, who do not get the demo ride, uh, they can go to the second floor. Uh, there are interesting stuff there. Uh, uh, there is a donkey car demo, which are the small uh, toy cars that we are using to, to teach the students the, the first basics of the autonomous driving. And also the simulation demo, where you can see the, the tar tr you can drive yourself around in the Tartu simulation. Okay. Uh, but I will start with my own presentation first. Uh, four topics I would like to quickly cover. The first, the autonomous driving lab background, then a little bit about on-demand transportation and the uh, autonomous on-demand transportation pilot we did in Tartu. And finally, some dreams that we are having in our lab. So first, the autonomous driving lab. Uh, the lab was founded in 2019 together with the Estonian uh, ride-hailing ride company, Bolt. Maybe you know them, maybe you have even taken taxi from them. Uh, and uh, together with the lab, uh, we also bought a car, uh, this Lexus car that you can see on the photo, uh, together with all the basic sensors needed for uh, autonomy. And sometimes people ask, like, why Lexus? Why such an expensive car? But uh, I must say that the sensors are, like, five times more expensive than the car. So the car is really, like, a small part of the budget. And uh, we set the goals for the lab. The first goal was to uh, evaluate the technology readiness for the robot taxi use case. So when uh, we can bring the robot taxis actually on the streets. And uh, so Poltz needs to know, needs to know when we need, they need to act and when it's ready, the time is ready, uh, the technologies are mature enough uh, for them to act. The second uh, and not less important is to do research uh, in uh, self-driving uh, technologies, to build kind of um, knowledge center here in Tartu about self-driving technologies. And finally, to prepare the future workforce for a Bolt or a similar uh, autonomous companies in Estonia. Uh, so this covers uh, educating the students and supervising the thesis and, uh, and uh, creating courses and so on. And for the first year uh, in 2019, uh, we set the goal for ourselves. We want to drive in uh, Tartu city center in a realistic traffic uh, situation autonomously at least 40 kilometers per hour. So this was quite ambitious goal in the sense that uh, uh, none of us had a prior experience with autonomous cars before. And the car is uh, like a two ton um, mass that uh, can just crush anybody on the street. Uh, so this, this was quite ambitious goal and um, but luckily, uh, we have the open source community. So we based our platform on the open source autoware software, and we got a lot of help from there. But there are some things that we didn't get from open source software. And one of those things uh, are the high definition maps. So the current generation of uh, autonomous cars need uh, high definition maps uh, of the driving area. And those maps, you can imagine your ordinary Google Maps, these are not those maps. These are much more detailed maps uh, because you need the lane level uh, details. So you need not to have one road, but you need to have each lane separately. And uh, these need to be like a centimeter, centimeter level, level accurate. 
So our first task was to map uh, the demo area. We chose the uh, demo lab around the uh, Delta uh, Center. Uh, nice surroundings in the city center of Tartu uh, at the riverside. And uh, we uh, mapped like uh, multiple pedestrian crossings, uh, traffic lights, bus stops, and so on. This lab is not too big. It's uh, like two kilometers or so. But I, uh, we thought that it contains enough interesting use cases for us to master in the first year. The second thing, uh, what became quite quickly obvious is that um, uh, camera-based traffic light detection uh, fails all the time. And uh, of course, you could spend a lot of time training better uh, neural network models for your traffic light detection. Uh, but we want it to be safe. Uh, and so what we did, oh, we uh, contacted the company handling the, the traffic lights in Tartu. Uh, it's called Trafest. And uh, they uh, gave us access to the traffic light control system. Uh, so, so we can read the machine readable state of each uh, traffic light. And if you really think about this, uh, it makes sense that instead of there's somewhere, there is a traffic light control center that knows the state of every traffic light in the town. And now we convert those, uh, this state into a light signals. Uh, and then we, so that people could see them like a red, green, uh, yellow light. And then we convert them back to machine readable signals using some neural network and cameras and so on. So why not directly read the machine-readable signal from the traffic control center? And uh, we did that, and it works way more reliably than the um, uh, camera-based uh, detection. We still have the camera-based detection as a backup if the um, network connections don't work properly, but uh, that's been our main detection method right now. And by the way, this server that you can see there, MQTT, uh, Cloud UTE, that's actually a public server. Uh, because traffic light state is not uh, uh, like uh, uh, some information that you should disclose from the others. It's public information. You can just go on the street and see what the traffic light shows. So you can read it uh, from this system if you want to. And sorry, the, the visualization is a little bit dark, but uh, that's one of the vi one visualization we built in our uh, in one of the teams. Uh, in our institute uh, to show the live state of the traffic lights. Another thing that we did uh, was that uh, when you create a self-driving car, you, you wouldn't want to go, uh, we first test it, of course, on the parking lot, but you wouldn't want to go and test it right away on the street with the real traffic. So we built a simulation of the same demo track around the Tartu city center, and uh, we had the same car with the exact same sensor set. And uh, you can drive around uh, in this uh, simulated world and do some basic testing. Uh, this is the same uh, simulation you can uh, experience later when you go to the second floor. Uh, and you can drive yourself uh, with the steering wheel in this simulation. And uh, we didn't build it completely from scratch. We used the existing engine, uh, SVL simulator for that. But uh, otherwise, it's rather good. The only problem with this simulation is that it's very expensive. So rendering this 3D world plus rendering all the sensors, the camera views, the LiDAR uh, detections, uh, it's uh, quite expensive. So you would need a, a double amount of compute. First, the autonomy stack, and then the simulation uh, itself. And usually we use two computers then, uh, one to run the simulation and one to run the autonomy stack. And you see there are nice uh, weather effects uh, that uh, we can change uh, the weather in, uh, in the simulation. I wonder if it's showing it right now. So you can change, uh, like make it more uh, rainy or, uh, or, uh, or uh, make the asphalt more wet or so on. Okay, so by September 2020, uh, we actually uh, got the car 
working well enough that we could test it on the streets, and that's what I'm going to show you next. So this is the demo from the September 2020, when we actually drove with our car in the city center of Tartu. Uh, of course, there was a safety driver in our car, usually two people, safety driver and a computer operator. And um, of course, this car is not perfect. It ca what it can do, is it can follow the traffic flow, it can follow the other cars, keep the distance with other cars, it can uh, stop for the traffic lights, uh, in good cases, it can uh, give way to the pedestrians on the uh, pedestrian crossings. Uh, but in all other cases, uh, the safety driver uh, takes over the control. And, uh, and mostly this happens uh, on the pedestrian crossings, because of what happens is that when there is a person next to the pedestrian crossing, it's hard to estimate if they are just standing there, are they planning to cross, are they talking with a phone, are they uh, talking with somebody else just walking by. Uh, this turns out to be a challenging uh, question and we haven't cracked that yet, but we have PhD students working on that. Uh, okay, uh, so I would like to move on. This was the September 2020. So what are our uh, most recent uh, uh, things we have, have been working on or uh, the, the, what we are spending our time on. One thing is on-demand tra transportation. Uh, so I will start, what is the on-demand transportation? So if you look at the mobility study of Tartu and its surroundings, then you see that uh, very few people, actually only 9% of people use the public transportation. All the other people, they use either car or go by foot or by bike, uh, somehow differently. Uh, only 9% people use the public transportation. And why they are not using it? Because uh, the bus schedules don't match or the bus routes don't match or the, it's too slow with multiple stops or the, maybe the closest stop is too far or so, so on. There are multiple reasons why they are not using the public transportation. And one solution to this, especially in uh, low density, low population density areas, is uh, on-demand transportation. What it means? It means that the bus comes and picks you up from your home. First, you order the bus uh, with app or phone or some other way. And then the bus comes, picks you up from home, home or maybe the nearest bus stop. Then it arrives when you need it. It doesn't go with a fixed route. Uh, it's not slowed down by the stops. If there are no other people to pick up, then it just goes. And in uh, low density, low population density areas, it can be cheaper than the uh, regular uh, bus transport. So uh, the project on the on-demand transportation has been going on in Tartu already since November uh, 2021, but uh, we joined it with an autonomous uh, vehicle. So our uh, Autonomous vehicle was one of the buses that uh, provided this uh, on-demand transportation service. And uh, the idea was that the autonomy can maybe make the on-demand uh, transportation even cheaper. And secondly, there was a, like a technical reason for us. Uh, actually, on intercity roads, uh, it's uh, easier to achieve autonomy than uh, in the busy city center. center. Because uh, like when you buy a um, uh, modern car, uh, like a new car, then most probably it comes with a lane centering and uh, this um, uh, distance keeping, uh, keeping the distance with a lead car uh, functionality. It's already built in in modern cars and it's pretty reliable and it works. So the idea was that uh, if we can, if this can be made to work so reliably, maybe the autonomous on-demand transportation in the rural areas is uh, something easier to achieve than the, in the city. So we had the transportation pilot with Tartu. Uh, it was in uh, Vorbuse Tiksoja area, for those who maybe know the surroundings of Tartu. Uh, we started in February with mapping, uh, but the actual uh, service period where, where we, with our autonomous vehicle provided the service was two weeks in April uh, 2022. And uh, we started mapping in February. Uh, 
I would like to claim that this was the most ambitious uh, autonomy, autonomy project in Estonia because the operation area was the uh, biggest to, of all those areas that I know of. So we mapped uh, like 66 kilometers of lanes and uh, which had uh, 26 on-demand bus stops, uh, many unregulated crossings, 66 traffic lights, 39 bus st uh, uh, stop lines. And in this area, you could go from any point A. Uh, so these are the bus stops. From any point A, you could go to any point B. And uh, the car would route itself. Uh, and also, we had uh, one important part of the project was integration with the infrastructure. Uh, so already, I already mentioned the integration with traffic light system uh, that we got uh, from the city traffic light control system, the traffic light state, but also we uh, connected with uh, Perkman two smart intersections. These are intersections which have uh, radars installed and the radar senses if there is a vehicle coming from this side and notifies our car that, oh, there is a car coming from this side, you might want to give way. And uh, also one uh, smart pedestrian crossing, again, when the pedestrian is standing next to the uh, pedestrian walkway, then uh, uh, the smart crossing senses it and gives our car a notification that, oh, maybe you should give way to this uh, pedestrian. And also we had an uh, integration with the ordering system, uh, vedas.e, so actually the people, the customers, when they ordered a normal bus or they ordered the, our autonomous vehicle, it all went through the same ordering system. So it was quite a challenging project with uh, multiple integrations. And the final results, uh, we did uh, 21 rides with uh, 33 passengers. Uh, this resulted in uh, more than 300 kilometers of driving. Our uh, safety driver and the computer operator, there were two people from our side in the car to guarantee the safety. Uh, they spent like 12 hours in the car. Uh, and the most important metric that we are looking at is uh, the number of disengagements or takeovers by the safety driver. So when the safety driver senses something uh, is not right, uh, the, it's a dangerous situation, then the safety driver can just take control of the car. There were 252 uh, takeovers by the safety driver, and uh, this makes it uh, like uh, 1.3 kilometers, uh, the average distance between uh, takeovers. Of course, uh, like the, the top companies in the world, uh, Cruise and Waymo, they have uh, better, uh, like thousands of kilometers. But I think for our small team, it's not bad results. I, I think it's pretty good. And we uh, traveled like 93% of the distance autonomously, but 85% of the time uh, autonomously. And why is that? Uh, the main reason for uh, disengagement or takeover was uh, stop. Every time we stop to, to pick up a person or uh, drop off a person, we uh, disengaged, we took over the control because the uh, moving into the car or moving out of the car is the most dangerous situation. So it makes sense that uh, we just don't take any risks there. And, uh, of course, as I said, uh, pedestrian crossings, uh, we always took over before the pedestrian crossings do not create any safe, uh, unsafe uh, situations at all. Uh, sometimes there were obstacles uh, that were not properly detected. This happened. Uh, sometimes our car uh, swerved too much in its lane, uh, and that also happened. Uh, Rerouting meant that uh, there were some uh, roadworks on our normal route, so we had to manually go around them and then uh, switch to autonomy again. Uh, giveaway fun functionality, we don't have it yet. Sometimes precaution was just the safety driver wasn't sure and uh, took over just as a precaution. Localization, sometimes uh, we position our car currently with a GPS and some additional uh, base stations. We have a very good localization accuracy, like five to 10 centimeters but sometimes it still fails. And, uh, and this localization accounts for that. 12 times the traffic lights was some problem. Uh, this is usually when the camera-based traffic light detection was used. 
Uh, and some others, but uh, there was one case when we had a once squirrel crossing the street and it was too small of obstacle for us to detect. So the safety driver again took over. Okay, and I would like to finish with some dreams we have uh, in our lab. We want to make Tartu the self-driving capital of Europe, of the Europe. And why is that? Why, why do, we, do we think that uh, that would be a good idea? Uh, we have four seasons in Estonia. Like usually the self-driving uh, cars are developed in California, which doesn't have this. Here you can test uh, all four different uh, weather conditions in, in one place. And we also have a friendly laws. Uh, when Starship wanted to bring their uh, autonomous robots on the streets, uh, that they quickly found a way how to make that happen. So, and uh, as we are talking, there is a process going on to allow the remotely controlled cars, the teleoperated cars on the streets. So this legislation is already in the process of uh, getting done. And of course, we have the strong base in the form of autonomous driving lab uh, that uh, could be made use. So, but what it means to be a capital of self-driving. So the idea was that we have a self-driving uh, testing center in Tartu. And what this self-driving testing center means. Uh, first, it would have a testing area with all the necessary equipment. For example, this uh, uh, pedestrian dummy that you can uh, make move uh, by triggering it when the, when the car comes to a certain distance and it starts moving. Uh, equipment like that. Secondly, we would like to have an entire Tartu uh, covered with a high definition map, the lane level map that I, that I talked about before. So that when you uh, validate your car in the testing area, you can uh, immediately move on to testing your car in the actual city settings. And all, make all traffic lights in Tartu machine readable. We have, uh, we have proof of concept that it's possible. Then have Tartu to simulation environment for those uh, people who would like to come uh, to test in Tartu but maybe are not sure yet, you, they can do the first testing in the simulation. And we have the city center, we want, would like to extend that uh, to different parts of Tartu. And also for students here in the uh, institute, we would like to have a miniature town uh, with uh, toy cars uh, where you can play those traffic situations with uh, real physical cars which are different than playing it in a simulation. And what value it brings? Hopefully in short term, we can provide service to Estonian companies like Ovete, Cleveron or Starship. But in long term, our dream would be to uh, convince some of the big names to come to test in Tartu, let's say Waymo, Cruise or uh, Intel or BMW. And if the testing comes here, then uh, there will be jobs uh, created and some know-how transferred for sure. So that um, enhances the, the knowledge center in, in Tartu. And finally, nobody else is going to validate if the self-driving works in Estonia, in Estonian weather conditions, in Estonian roads, with Estonian traffic uh, signs and so on. Nobody else is going to validate it uh, other than uh, our, ourselves. So we must do it in Estonia somehow uh, to be prepared for the autonomous cars. So that's all from me. Uh, I don't know if we have time for uh, questions. Yeah, shoot. Thanks, it was a really interesting presentation. I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, you said uh, you're both using the, I don't read the traffic lights, and also you're using the sensors at the same time. Don't you think that uh, increasing this uh, system, the software system, might increase the error rate for your system? And isn't it better to use both of these systems all in the same time to increase the reliability of your, I don't know, uh, diagnosis or something? I think it's a good observation that it definitely makes the system a little bit more complicated. And this is one of the research areas that we are looking into, how to quantify the uncertainty we get uh, from the camera-based detection and the uncertainty we get from the uh, traffic light control center. Uh, 
the uncertainty from traffic light control center is in general pretty low. <laughs> uh, it's pretty reliable source, but sometimes there are, there are uh, network delays, uh, so the information may come as a little bit late or too earlier. And, uh, and also what's interesting problem is uh, you have, you can see the same traffic light uh, from multiple uh, cameras. And uh, then you need, and, and maybe one detection says it's green, the other one says it's uh, red. And uh, how do you quantify uh, then uh, which one you trust? And uh, yeah, these are all uh, open problems that uh, we are researching with uh, our research team. Okay. And may I ask, you said that uh, the driver itself has this uh, open window to decide whether he wants to or she wants to get the control or not. And how long is this window? I mean, how, how, how much in advance you inform the driver that you have to take the action if the system is uh, facing any error? Sorry, I, I, I guess I didn't fully get it. Do, yeah, do you mean that uh, how long it takes for safety driver to react or? I, I mean, your system is on autonomous driving mode and you face some error and you want the driver to get the control and uh, this is a time window for the driver. How, how, how long in advance you inform the driver to get the control to action? So the way it happens is that uh, when the safety driver just makes any move with the steering wheel or touches any of the pedals, then uh, immediately the autonomy function is disengaged and disconnected. I'm asking about the other way around. So if the autonomous is on and uh, some error occur and it decided to, it cannot make a decision anymore. I mean, it might end up in a disaster, for instance, crashing to some person or something, so you have to inform the driver. Yeah, this is the situation I think we don't currently handle. Uh, that autonomy assumes that it can handle everything and when it cannot, then it just fails. Also, also. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then the safety driver takes over. So it raises up another question that, uh, do you have any standard to bring this thing into the streets? Uh, again, this, uh, this concerns the, the validation and testing, uh, like a research area that we are looking into. Uh, there is uh, one, um, like a mathematical model that we are looking into is the, uh, re responsibility uh, sen uh, sensitive safety RSS and uh, this is the method uh, developed in Intel actually in Mobileye that was acquired by Intel and this is one of the methodologies that we are looking into uh, which I think recently was turned into some kind of standard so we are looking into this but again we uh, there are many things uh, that you should be doing, but you cannot do everything. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, there is one there. Hi, thank you for presentation. Uh, I have this question, uh, this simulation environment. Uh, have you modeled it manually or uh, have you used some automation like scans or something like that? Like that? Currently, the simulation environment was done by a bachelor student manually. Uh, what we used, this simulation environment is still decimeter level accurate compared to the real world. We used uh, LiDAR point clouds from uh, Estonian land board, uh, which are very accurate. Uh, they uh, represent the elevation uh, very accurately. And, uh, and using those point clouds, yeah, we, we believe that uh, uh, the simulation is like a decimeter level accurate, but it was still made manually, indeed. Uh, how much time approximately took to create model of Tartu City Center, for example? Uh, I think uh, he worked like a half a year on this, but uh, it was from scratch, uh, learning everything on the go. Uh, right now, the same student is doing masters and we are planning to look into autom automating some of the uh, things that he did. Thank you. But this on-demand circle is not on the virtual? Yes, that, that's not. The, uh, the virtual town only includes this little lap around the delta. Uh, 
I have the question maybe more related to my field. And um, well, I will not describe my field, but uh, my question: um, which type of controls you are using for your soldering cars? And my second question: this requires a lot of controllers. I mean, the independent branch of the independent controllers, or you can uh, control entire process of the drawing by one single unit. And when you say uh, what kind of controls we are using, what do you mean? Do you mean like a uh, steering wheel angle uh, or speed or curvature or, or... I mean, not a control loop, I mean the type of control. For example, we have classical controllers like PID control, if you hear about them. Yes. And so we have fuzzy logic, we have model predictive controllers, we have neural network based controllers, etc. So, so currently we use the model predictive control model MPC predictive. Uh, to follow the trajectory that was produced by the planner. The planner produces the trajectory and then MPC converts this trajectory into steering wheel commands. Okay, great. Just uh, I'm from the control field, so it's kind of easy for me to understand the problematic of uh, your field. And uh, just my Question for my curious: uh, Do you have any collaboration with the Italian University of Technology? Is uh, your field? We we have met them. Uh, <laughs> At least we met them. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a> good, yeah. <laughs> uh, we have discussed with them uh, some research directions. Uh, we haven't arrived to any specific collaboration yet, but we are hoping to do so in future. I'm asking because we have similar projects. For example, the, we have the prototype of self-driving bus, which has quite mm -hmm. small size, but still looks like these guys have some specific success, but uh, looks like they are not achieved at even your level, maybe. <laughs> I don't want to criticize them because I just reflect my <coughs> perception of what they're doing. But I don't know any details of what they're doing exactly. Mm -hmm. But uh, just my personal maybe recommendation just uh, as a technical university, we have maybe some aspects more experience than Tartu University, so it makes uh, sense to provide more deeper collaboration in future. Mm. Yes, uh, maybe one disti distinction we have for our lab is we want to focus mainly on software, not so much on hardware, not so much on sensors, uh, not so much on uh, low-level stuff, but uh, high-level um, control of the car, uh, high-level planning. Um, and maybe that differentiates us from maybe some other labs. So how is the situation with questions? I saw that there are some questions, still more. Hi, so uh, we implemented uh, the AutoWare on Nisa Auto 2018, and uh, back then I think uh, the Japanese got the result of like 95% of the time it could drive autonomously. So do you have now better examples that somebody has been able to use AutoWare and achieve much better results? I think we are actually at the very edge or at the, what the autoware can do. Uh, actually, we have already made a decision that we are going to move away from autoware because it's limiting our abilities. And the code base is kind of old and clunky and uh, bloated. And um, yeah, we are planning to move into more data-driven uh, uh, approach. And uh, so some experiments, what we are doing, uh, we have a data set uh, uh, collected from Rally Estonia tracks. And uh, we are using machine learning models to drive the car on Rally Estonia tracks. There we achieve like two and a half kilometers per uh, between these engagements. But this is much simpler situation. There are almost no other cars. Basically, you are alone on the road. Uh, and there machine learning kind of works fine. Uh, we are planning to, pro to step by step move from those uh, rural roads to uh, highways to, to city situations, but it will take time. And uh, 
the machine learning or data-driven methods are much harder to test and debug and understand why they make mistakes. Okay, I think people want to move on to the actual stuff. Yes. So yes, tell what's happening it. next. So let's go outside and let's meet in the courtyard. Uh, you should see the car there and you will get a short introduction of the sensors and then we do a lottery and some people get to experience it yourself. I must warn that. <laughs> Because of the out of the, the the street is closed uh, where we usually test. So we needed to change our route. And we had some struggles getting it work really perfectly on that new route. But so expect some jerkiness. But uh, you should be fine. You should be fine. <laughs> Don't be afraid. 